We have Paul Von Ward on the line, and we are going to go to him now. Welcome and good evening to the show, Paul. You're on the air. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. You're, it's a pleasure to have you here. So we're here to discuss your work on uh, the soul genome and uh, your work is a, is a work in spirituality overall, uh, but you didn't begin that way. How, how you actually started out as a Protestant minister? Can can you give us a little bit of background information uh, as far as your your progression possibly into a more spiritual belief system in actually natural spirituality? Sure. Uh, like uh, everyone else, I grew up in a an established uh, culture uh, uh, that had a lot of uh, influence on my early development. I think most of us come into life and get engaged initially that way. And some of us stay in the same sort of cultural fr uh, framework or mindset uh, the rest of their lives. But uh, most of us actually evolve over time. And I grew up in the rural uh, backwoods of northwest Florida back in the 40s and the 50s, and uh, the only uh, sort of intellectual uh, stimuli, I guess one would say, that was available at that time uh, was that of local fundamentalist religious groups of one sort or the other. So I developed in that in that fashion but i uh, remember very vividly uh, when i actually joined the church uh, and uh, was saved as the uh, terminology was used in those days uh, at age 12 but the next paul, day I, paul yeah. can i can i uh, i'm getting i'm actually reading this in the shtf 411.com chat room uh, can you speak up a little bit i, I think they're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, well, let's see. You want to t test the uh, the volume? Is it going now? Uh, yeah, I think so. you're. That's much better. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just try to hold the uh, receiver a little bit more directly in front of my mouth. And let's okay. and to make that story short. <laughs> I, I, I grew out very quickly as I went off to college and started, uh, uh, particularly reading in. Uh, comparative religions and philosophy and, and finding out that uh, the world was very different than the uh, very narrow-minded uh, community that I had grown up in. So by the time I was uh, in uh, my junior year or senior year in college, I had developed uh, very much, though, in the, in the church and had been ordained as a minister. And in fact, as, as I started graduate school, uh, I had a small church outside of Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, but during gra the first year of grad graduate school, I had some experiences with uh, people who really uh, changed my perspective. One of them was the renowned uh, Protestant theologian, uh, Paul Tillich, who came to our university and uh, talked to him about definitions of God. And when this great theologian sat there in front of our little group and said, well, it depends on your definition. <laughs> And I began to uh, say, okay, well, let me think about what my definition is. And for a long time, ever so often, I would write down my definition of God. And years later, when I looked at it, I really made some radical shifts as I uh, studied other religions and met other people. And so I left graduate school and went into the Navy and then in the Foreign Service and traveling around the world for 15 or more years to many, many countries, uh, reading uh, many uh, historical text and religious text and uh, looking into the cultural belief systems of many different societies on the planet. And I, I came to some sort of uh, what I call eclectic, uh, natural uh, spirituality as uh, a way that I found satisfactory uh, to uh, merge uh, what I had learned as uh, a student of science in, in college and university, and uh, looking at the belief systems that people had about humans being something more than physical beings, biological beings. There was something deeper and more multidimensional about that. And so I've, I've, uh, over the years after I 
uh, had a lot of activities and this cross-cultural career that I've had. Uh, I've been writing now for the last uh, 15 plus years. Uh, books like those that you mentioned, uh, one earlier one was Our Solarian Legacy, which was on multidimensional humans in a self-learning universe. That's sort of a cosmology that uh, merges the notion of uh, other dimensions that are not in our 4D reality that most of us experience on a daily basis. Now, you actually, one of your, your very first book, I, I have to ask, this is actually, an, I, I, it's almost another show, but I want to ask because I read something. It, it's Dismantling the Pyramid, Government by the People. Now, when I read excerpts from that and, and your thoughts on it, you basically said that a, a people get the government that they they embody, that they ask for, that, a ref- that they deserve. Uh, that, yes, that it's a reflection of society. Can, that's, that's correct. Now, it just seems like it molds into everything else you're working on. Well, you know, I didn't think about it in those terms uh, for about 10 or 15 years because I wrote that book, Dismantling the Pyramid, Government by the People, actually about 30 years ago. And it was a point in my life where I had been in the Foreign Service and the State Department in Washington for about 15 years, and I had been chosen uh, by some senior officials along with a number of other young middle Uh, not middle age, but middle grade officials in the government. We weren't at the top, but we had a good bit of experience. And I was actually uh, given the opportunity to go to Harvard to develop a master's degree in uh, public administration, studying organizational psychology and government reform and all those things, because a number of people at that time, and this was uh, taking place uh, in the last years of the Nixon administration, And when the Carter administration began, uh, we thought we had a lot of opportunity to make some changes uh, to reform the self-perpetuating sort of uh, insulated bureaucracy and special interest and uh, corporate uh, lobbyists and so on that we know so much about today. It, It existed at that time, and so I wrote this book to talk about how this uh situation that we've worked ourselves into with a government that is not uh, able to really reflect the uh, needs and priorities of of the citizens that have uh, supported it. Uh, And I I thought that was sort of a political uh, book, and as I went on and worked in other areas, particularly in international cultural and educational training and so on, I I left it behind, but then more recently I have come to realize that uh, what you say is true. The the institutions that we create and that we support as a people really reflect uh, the limitations of our own uh, uh, development as citizens and as communities uh, in the nation. And so I've been talking a lot recently about the notion of self-governance. Now, as I mentioned, you know, that book, Our Solarian Legacy, which was my first interdisciplinary cosmology that I've I've worked on, uh, what came out of that in in the research that I did in physics and biology and history and uh, the social sciences and so on is that, you know, we are actually a self-learning universe, and all species are self-learning. That is, we experiment, we have have, uh, the results of our behaviors uh, manifest in our lives, and we learn something from that experience. We either learn a lot or we don't learn very much, but nevertheless, we're self-learning people. So if we are self-learning spiritual beings, uh, then governance should be thought of as self-governance. And so that's the theme that I've been developing more recently in articles and and talks that I do, that we as individuals have the responsibility to uh, develop a system of governance that is a reflection of ourselves. And it's that challenge that we're facing right now that we're 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 split. Uh, government has become encapsulated in its own interest 
uh, and its own priorities, and people who get into it uh, become very much uh, dependent on perpetuating the institutions for their own protection, mm-hmm. for their own mm-hmm. benefits. So it all does mm. fit together. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I've got a. I want to hear about what occurred 11,000 years ago or around that ballpark. I want to hear about the ancient astronauts, but I almost feel there's a couple questions that come first. I don't know. Okay. It's, it's the chicken or the egg type, you know, which came first kind of question. Right. But in a nutshell, what are we and where we came from or where did we come from? I mean, now I know those are huge questions and, and I'll get more in detail, but, uh, can can you somewhat give us an overview there? Well, I think that uh, the evidence that we have from all of our sciences and all of our uh, cultural traditions is that uh, we are conscious beings that have been manifested by the fundamental level of consciousness from which the universe itself was created or, or developed. Uh, I think that as we look at the notion of the Big Bang and the traditional conventional scientific perspective on on cosmology, when we encapsulate that in the spiritual, philosophical, and religious traditions of all cultures, uh, we begin to see that uh, we are, as Homo sapiens, simply a part of the web of conscious life on this planet and it's now becoming more and more manifest uh, that the possibility exists that it's throughout the universe and we're part of that. At the same time these spiritual traditions and what we now know as the science of paranormal phenomena and the subtle senses and that whole area of work we are multidimensional, so and we are in contact with other, both physical and non-physical conscious entities in the universe. So this this says that where we came from is we don't really know, except that we can, uh, I think, infer with a great deal of uh, justification that it was pure consciousness that is experimenting with itself and that we are part of that and that the universe is an evolving organism, a self-evolving organism, and we are direct manifestations of that. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't get entangled with other species and other levels of life, but that each of these species is a direct manifestation of the conscious that started it all. Mm. Now, there obviously are a lot of, of especially let's say in the, the Western world, we have the, the uh, theory or the belief that there was a fall of mankind, that we, we fell, let's say, fell from grace. Uh, do you find that to be truthful in any way or have any kind of validity? Are we somehow a reject of what we were? Well, yeah, that, that, that to me that's very speculative. And I think that... Uh, there is not any evidence for that. I think the evidence that uh, we have thus far is that we have been a gradually evolving species uh, since the first hominids, uh, you know, walked around on this planet uh, five million years ago. Uh, Now, somewhere along the way, we had different uh, rates of evolution, sometimes very slowly, sometimes very um, much more rapidly and also the thesis of my book God's Genes and Consciousness is that at one point in that evolutionary path where we were working on our own development in a natural setting uh, we had beings more advanced than we uh, were at the time uh, intervene in our development and this is the story of the Anunnaki in the Sumerian tablets, uh, the gods of the Sanskrit and Vedic uh, literature, the gods of Greek and Roman history and Egyptian uh, uh, stories, and even the natural aboriginal groups that we've got around the world, they still
still uh, have the stories of interventions by advanced beings from the skies. So what happened as a result of that, human beings uh, both learned a lot of things that were uh, new and more advanced than they had before, but they also uh, became dependent on and uh, developed a sense of inferiority vis-a-vis these advanced beings. Now, uh, I think the fall theory is uh, simply part of the mythology of supernaturalism, that is the uh, development of the notion that there are these gods who are divine and we are not divine, uh, and we developed this myth that somehow we used to be divine and then we fell from grace, and that is a story, an interpretation that I think has developed by the uh, advanced beings themselves. I mean, we were obviously less developed than they were. They came in spaceships. We were still uh, growing our vegetables and hunting animals and and developing small communities on, on, on planet Earth. So there was that sense of a discrepancy between the level of culture and level of society. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that we, we had fallen. Uh, and, and I think the, the concept of the fall was taken over basically by uh, Western Christianity, Roman Christianity, uh, to tell humans, you know, you're unworthy, uh, you have to join the church, you have to... Uh, go through the rituals of initiation and so on that we expect you to go through and you must obey us as the priest and the popes and so on and uh, you must uh, uh, give your resources to support the the church and its uh, activities and so on. Uh, But that was just used as a control mechanism. Uh, Now, there is another theory about the concept of the fall And that's a theory that uh, we as conscious beings have an integral body that uh, exists both while we're incarnated here. Uh, It also has these other dimensions which which exist on another level. And the fact that we are born in physical form is sort of a fall from that ethereal... Uh, more subtle uh, existence that our conscious mind, uh, for the most part, inhabits. So that's another theory of the fall. Uh, William Thompson, the guy uh, who has been well known for writing about this theme uh, many years ago, uh, articulated that very well. Mm-hmm. Now, there are uh, to to finish up that level of questions. I, I've got one more question. It's actually from a forum member participating in the shtf411.com chat room. Uh, he says, "In like w- what he wants to know, excuse me, uh, how can there be no proof of a fall? He says that our cells should always regenerate, yet the code to cause that seems to be turned off. Uh, he's asking if that does not show. I think he's uh, trying to, to ask, was there uh, genetic manipulation, that possibly we had genetic uh, manipulation via higher life forms? Well, I think we had genetic manipulation, but it was to actually go in the opposite direction. In other words, we uh, were, uh, how do I say, we were merged with the genetic uh, uh, potential uh, of more advanced life forms. And if we look at the uh, fossil record and the genetic record from, say, Homo erectus, uh, which I think is the the sort of last uh, natural developing uh, group of humans, the Neanderthal, I think, were also part of the manipulation. So about 250,000 years ago, both the fossil record and the genetic record shows a a tremendous uh, jump a leap, and some people call it the missing uh, gap, in our evolution. And not only was it a physical upgrade, 
uh, it was also an intellectual upgrade by the instruction of uh, humans, by these advanced beings, teaching us the technology that they already had developed, uh, the mathematical systems, uh, knowledge about the uh, universe, all of these things uh, were taught to us that this is part of the technical assistance that we got from more advanced beings. And in fact, we were going along pretty well. And then they decided to pull out, according to the Anunnaki story. Uh, they were called the Anakim in the Old Testament. Uh, pulled away and then left humans here. And we look in history and we find that about uh, 3,500 years ago, 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, uh, we see that these uh, very highly developed early civilizations began to go through a period of decline and decay. And that's because the advanced beings were no longer around to keep things under control, and the local human kings and the uh, hybrid humans who were uh, uh, hybrids of the advanced beings and human uh, mothers uh, uh, they they were not able to keep up the level of technology and the level of civilization that we were experiencing. Now, some people think the uh, story of Atlantis uh, reflects that, that, that we had developed a certain level of technology and social competence, uh, but that disappeared along with most of the existing civilizations about 11,500 years ago when we had the worldwide cataclysm that's referred to as the flood in the Bible and other uh, similar tales from around the earth. And we have a lot of biological, geological, uh, historical uh, accounts that put it at about 11,500 years ago. And so the survivors who uh, uh, were able to escape the the destruction, the, the, it, it was a global event apparently with the passing uh, through of very near to us another body, it could have been a large asteroid, another planet, uh, uh, something very big enough to disrupt our magnetic fields, to cause all kinds of geological upheavals. Uh, we have uh, mountain chains, the Andes and the Himalayas and the Swiss Alps and, uh, and the Rockies all were uplifted to greater heights about that time. Uh, and you had uh, volcanoes erupting, sea levels changing, all sorts of physical uh, effects of some near pass, uh, near miss, I guess I should say, uh, of our own planet. And so now, the last 7,000 years of culture has been redeveloping uh, where we had lost it uh, at that point in time. Now, let me ask, we're talking about ancient history here. Uh, there are a lot of researchers out there that claim that there were different factions and that there was infighting at the same time of upheaval. Are, are you of that? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm very much of that opinion. Uh, I think Zachariah Sitchin's work, uh, you know, is really uh, the greatest amount of research on this particular area that anyone has, has made up to this point. And he points out, and I point out in, in my writing, some of the conflicts and what was happening. And I'll just use an example that's familiar to both most of us in the Christian culture of the United States. Uh, the notion of Yahweh and the uh, Israelites uh, fighting with Baal and the Babylonians. Uh, Baal and Yahweh are uh, two names of some of those uh, ABs, as I call them, advanced beings, the Anakim or the Anunnaki, uh, fighting among themselves because what happened uh, is that these senior beings, uh, were put in charge of sort of uh, what we might call small states or small countries or territorial uh, areas that they were responsible for and that they used, and uh, they had their own uh, assistants, the humans and the hybrids, uh, uh, working for them. And one of the things they developed, in, in, a, in addition to the priesthood, which were really the interpreters and the, the household 
uh, support staff for these advanced beings was a military uh, function. And these uh, ABs who were fighting among themselves used the human military to fight among themselves. Mm. So that's a that's a tradition that we learned in that era, and we haven't uh, haven't gotten over it yet. No, no, and that brings up the question of when we talk about these ABs, these advanced beings. Uh, in today's day and world, uh, day and age, we have uh, elitists. We have actual people that we can point to and say. Not only did they make a ton of money in their lifetime, but generationally their family has controlled empires. Uh, do you believe that everyone on Earth right now is simply humankind, or are there, for example, any elites? Do they have a uh, different genetic makeup? Um, uh, I don't think that in general they have uh, significantly different uh, genetic makeup. The only difference would be that uh, where you have had uh, relatively uh, more uh, intergroup, intragroup uh, breeding among certain families, but I don't think that it is of any great significance in terms of intellect or physical capabilities uh, as far as the humans are concerned. Uh, and I know that there are people who believe that we have uh, even more modern hybrids where other species have been uh, interacting with uh, the human genome and creating hybrids among ourselves. But I don't think those are the ruling uh, families and so on that we see. Uh, those ruling families have shifted uh, as the economic uh, makeup of cultures have changed. Uh, I mean, right now, some of the most powerful and wealthy people are uh, people in our own culture who've developed new technologies and become quite wealthy and quite powerful from that point of view. Uh, in fact, I think the old blue bloods and the royal families that about three or four thousand years ago claimed to be, uh, you know, the the divine rulers on the planet because they were given their position by these ABs. Uh, those families have been so interbred and uh, so uh, uh, insulated that uh, they no longer have that power that they had early on. Now, I think some of the institutions do in terms of banking centers that have developed in terms of uh, uh, religious uh, institutions, uh, certainly the the, the, the Catholic uh, uh, religious institutions have re remained uh, centralized and, and self-controlled and self-protecting, uh, you know, for the last 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years. Uh, so I, I don't I don't I don't see any evidence of, of that. I, I think I see people looking out for their own interest and, and s taking the resources from all the rest of us and using those resources to uh, insulate themselves, protect themselves from all the other challenges that we have on the planet. Let me ask you, uh, when we look at uh, what generally people call the elite, let's say, uh, it appears that a lot of them are for all intents and purposes, psychopaths, I mean, close to it. Uh, do you believe that there are people that, that have lost their essence or their soul, let's say their spirit or soul? I mean, do we literally have just, incarnate, for lack of better terminology, incarnate meat walking around that has no conscience? Well, uh, conscience is a social construct, you know, uh, which develops over time and culture and learning. Uh, and I think that people who behave uh, in a dastardly way uh, towards other people are not any less human or any more human. I think they are simply uh, on a different track of this evolutionary process that I talked about earlier. And mm -hmm. some people who have been 
uh, kept and trained and conditioned in a particular uh, uh, cult or a particular family uh, can be very, very, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, they, they, they simply don't care about anybody else. They care about only their own situation. Mm-hmm. But, but it doesn't, to me, that that doesn't mean anything, have anything to do with the absence of a soul or presence of a soul. We all have souls. We all have this multidimensional reality mm-hmm. that's called the soul genome. So, anyhow, that's that's my perspective on it. Sure. Um, I don't really know. <laughs> sure. Well, no, that's, I mean, that's the, the purpose in, in, in these discussions and, and books and is, is a search for answers. Um, it seems like right. the world is getting continually further and further away. Uh, I say that, and then other times I have cause for hope. But Right. <laughs> well, I think there is cause for hope. I mean, Go ahead. Uh, the things that are happening politically right now in Tunisia and Egypt and so on, people, there is a uh, universal yearning for the freedom and the uh, resources to be what I have just described as self learning, self-evolving beings. And when other beings take away that opportunity or put constraints on it, it will come out at some point or the other. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in your opinion, is there any difference between uh, human evolution and and spiritual evolution? I mean, are are we like it uh, in the Bible, Omega and Alpha and Omega, or, or I mean, are we just it, or are we physically and spiritually evolving beings? And, and I think we're. I think we're both, and I think we do it at the same time. Uh, see, the the notion of a multidimensional being, or the the, the fact that uh, we have what I would call a soul genome, that implies that we are both spiritual and physical at the same time it, it's uh, it's not a either or we we are uh, connected uh, we are both body mind and spirit if you want to use that uh, triad as a way to think about it other cultures have talked about it as five layers the egyptians talked about it as five layers and you know other cultures have different concepts but basically we have uh, this uh, three dimensional uh, aspects, the set of aspects, and uh, it's, I, I think that uh, a lot, there's a lot of uh, discussion about our higher selves, our higher beings, and this, this suggests that there is the possibility that the amount of our consciousness that's focused on living the daily life here on the planet uh, has to be focused and narrowed uh, down in terms of vision and and scope of of activity. But that doesn't mean that we have left behind this higher uh, functioning. And we can can access that sometimes through meditation and through uh, just uh, intuitive insights. Uh, And, you know, we have the saying, uh, well, it's the person's better self speaking now, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lower self. So I see it, uh, I see, and and, you, and this is not separate, you know, from the rest of the universe. One of the things we're learning in physics today, and I think we're learning also in consciousness studies and, and the way the epigenome works, and the way the brain uh, works, we are uh, embedded in the whole thing so that we are entangled with every dimension and every other being in the universe. All that we are is I as a being, I'm something like a laser of light. Light is everywhere. We cohere it or concentrate it uh, in one location in space-time as a laser beam, and we can see it, and it can do physical damage. And so our bodies are are like that, in in my view, uh, that we are uh, a more coherent a more substantive manifestation of this more ethereal self, uh, which we cannot get rid of, 
and which we likely, uh, in between uh, incarnations, are solely in that dimension. And then we come back into the material dimension, as we have in, you know, all of our particles. I mean, they they come out of the uh, quantum plenum, and we see them as a particle, uh, or, or as a wave in, in, in this dimensional uh, part of the universe. And then it's gone, and then it comes back. And so I think that all of us are part of that uh, polarity, you know, the... the the light and the dark, uh, any way, even the positive and negative. And we are organisms uh, behaving in that, in that web of life. Now, in this, this train of thought, uh, does this apply to animals, plants, even to the earth itself? I mean, Absolutely. is it all? It is. Absolutely. I mean, in my view, it's all the same. Uh, there are varying degrees. I mean, anyone who has pets, anyone who's worked with animals, anyone who's studied biology, anyone who has actually uh, uh, attempted to open himself or herself to experiencing nature, there's no way that we can get away from the notion that we are all embedded in this one uh, huge live uh, organism. Now, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I, I just I have some questions that are coming up. Uh, for example, do you believe in, in your your soul genome? If if I'm not mistaken, what you uh, propose is that our our genome, our DNA, is actually uh, the manifestation in all realms. Is that correct? In other words, uh, when we leave here, we'd still have that genetic holographic form. And then when we come back, that's used as a blueprint to basically make us similar. Yeah, I would. I like the notion of hologram. Uh, Edgar Mitchell is talking about this as a concept to sort of put a lot of his ideas together, uh, given his experience coming back from the moon and uh, the work that he's done as a physicist and uh, uh, scientist looking at all of this. And, and we've had talks about it, and I, I, I agree that the notion... Uh, uh, that we are in some way a holographic universe. Uh, Michael Talbot, you know, wrote this very well-known book about 20 years ago on the holographic universe. So the notion is that uh, we are all the whole and each part of us is the whole and the whole is in us. So uh, what we have uh, and and it's interesting. I follow, you know, the d different scientific scientific disciplines from sort of an interdisciplinary point of view, and uh, physics uh, and biology is now uh, the, the two together in their research coming to the to the view that our genome, our genes that we've talked about for the last twenty five thirty years, are really uh, only physical manifestations of patterns that we don't even know how they're functioning. And it's called the epigenome. And uh, there's research now, I'm just reading in Scientific American uh, uh, the last uh, week or so, an article where we're, we have mainstream scientists now talking about what a guy in France 200 years ago was talking about. It was the concept of acquired characteristics are that is learning or the learning from our experience gets transferred to subsequent generations and so the soul genome concept is really uh, along that line that what we do in this lifetime uh, is uh, a coherent package of memories uh, patterns of energy habits and all of those things that are coherent enough that when we uh, have a physical death, that is, the, the material matter dissolves away, uh, this set of holographic soul genome patterns survives. It does uh, some mingling with others uh, in the new sphere or the 
collective consciousness, whatever word you want to use for that, and it probably learned something in that uh, in that sphere. It also uh, uh, may share with other souls, with other beings, some of its experiences. So we have people coming back in uh, incarnated form who represent the experiences of a previous lifetime, but they may also have some uh, incorporated, some of the lessons learned by other beings. So uh, my view now of, of reincarnation is not that we have just a tight little ball of soul that stays exactly as it is from lifetime to lifetime, but it's a much more ephemeral uh, field of, of consciousness and energy uh, that is much more interactive with similar uh, spheres in this other realm, just the way we are on this planet. I mean, we are affected by the people around us. We affect them. We trade uh, our diseases. We uh, trade our knowledge, our insights. You know, it's a it's a live it's sort of like the brain with all the neurons and all of its axons and all of its um, uh, sensory neurons and the motor neurons, all having these dendrites and synapses, keeping a flow of communication going around all the time. Uh, that's nothing is stops; it simply uh, waxes and wanes. And I think that's the way the soul is, vis-à-vis -vis other souls. Now, do you do you believe the soul actually resides in the DNA? I mean, does it does the soul have a specific home? Let's no, say no, 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 no. The soul, uh, the DNA, is actually the uh, specific local manifestation of that soul. Uh, in other words, the the patterns, because see, DNA is nothing but patterns. Uh, it's it's patterns that uh, uh, help form proteins to help form the organs, that help to uh, uh, shape life and maintain life. Uh, and what uh, geneticists are now coming to realize is that it's not the genes per se that cause a disease or cause you to have a certain physical feature or something. It is a combination of energetic patterns, of uh, some sort of process of turning on and off these switches that make us a little different today and a little different tomorrow. Uh, so the, what we call the, the DNA is really only a local, uh, it's our local perception at a physical level, of this larger uh, body of patterns, memories, uh, et cetera. So the the DNA would almost be a, a projection of the soul, right? That... And that's a better way of thinking about it. Because uh, if you if you can think of it, normally when we use the word projection, we think of a one of the old movie projectors flashing out a, a, a ray of light, you know, and then you could see the the image on the screen, uh, what you're describing is the is the opposite. It's the image on the screen and the light waves coming that <laughs> create the projector. So the DNA is the projector. It's it's the physical uh, embodiment, if you want to use that term, uh, of, of of the more and and the physical is the least uh, is the most temporary. It's the least durable. What's more durable is the energetic and the levels of consciousness that uh, we're embedded in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, our next question, uh, these questions are a combination of, of my questions along with forum member questions, so I have to try and uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> figure out. Uh, They're stimulating, I must say. Yeah. Now, th there is... Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that, that believe that, uh, I, I can't even say believe, you know, it feels like we ha literally have evil incarnate on planet Earth. We've got uh, serial killers, we've got psychopaths, 
uh, we're in wars constantly. Uh, do you, this is a, let me try and see if I can phrase this correctly. The basic question is, is there evil? But I want to maybe move that a little further. Can an advanced soul or just a soul being, can they devolve into something that is uh, almost a stagnant nature uh, of non-evolving, just stagnant and very physical? Let's let let's say first of all that good and evil are those are social uh, constructs. Mm -hmm. uh, fr from the point of view of a self-evolving, uh, self-learning universe, there are only constructive and destructive behaviors. Now we know that many destructive behaviors are necessary in order to be constructive, and we know that. Uh, when we're trying to be constructive, we are sometimes destroying. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't want to speak in terms of good and evil. I want to speak in terms of individuals on their own paths of evolution and learning and the mistakes that we all make. One of the theories that some people have of reincarnation is that uh, if, let's say, you have you know, a hundred lifetimes in your past, uh, you may have been a warrior in some instances, you may have been a, uh, a bestial uh, husband of a family, uh, you may have been uh, a, a social worker in another one, you could have been a young woman who is a creative dancer and musician in another one. And so uh, it depends on the circumstances of how you end up in a particular lifetime and what the what the collective circumstances are and any any uh, one of these activities can be seen from another perspective for example I was a few years ago in the south of France uh, uh, looking at uh, the uh, area where the the, the Catholic Church uh, would come in and burn uh, the heretics who were in that village in the courtyard of the church. Uh, now, you would say, isn't that evil? <laughs> From those pe people's point of view, the evil ones were being burned. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to justify any um, destructive act. But I'm simply saying that in this universe, we do have this polarity. We do have these uh, pros and cons. It's one of the principles. Uh, I sort of go back to the hermetic principles from time to time because there, there are seven of them that uh, are considered to be uh, sort of universal ideas that can account for most anything. And one of them is the principle of polarity. So that whatever you have on one side, you're going to have the opposite on the other. And that happens in uh, our black holes, you know, in the universe. Uh, we have uh, universes being born, and we have black holes sucking universes, uh, not universes, I'm sorry, galaxies, uh, our star systems, into them and destroying them. So in a universe like this, you have got construction and destruction. And uh, it goes back and forth, and uh, there are times, as you say, when people are behaving in a retrogressive, uh, retrograde uh, manner. In fact, they're doing worse than they did before. Well, uh, sure, that, 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 that's where I was going with that. I mean, if, if we're looking at it from the creation standpoint or a creative, destructive standpoint, it, that's, you're making my point as far as it seems like there are, we're in a time where there are people that are very, very imbalanced on the destructive. Right, yeah. All of us have a little bit, and uh, some have more. There, mm -hmm. No one is no one is a perfect paragon, and no one is a, a complete uh, devil, you know. Uh, we're all on a continuum. That's one of the things... Uh, that we notice about nature, everything is on a continuum. There's nothing that is exact. There is no set of DNA on this planet that is completely matched by another. 
there's no uh, solar system matched by another one that's exactly like it. And on and on, you know, you you, you can see that everything has this sort of continuum of <laughs> strong to weak uh, to dark to light, etc. Mm-hmm. Now, do you believe that <clears throat> when when they they manipulated or intervened on a genetic level, do you believe that these advanced beings uh, intervened on a soul level as well? I mean, is it po- if they manipulated one, could they have possibly manipulated oh, the other? No. Well, it's, it's not separate. It's not separate. I mean, the, the, you can't have a multidimensional universe and then say, oh, well, this is not connected to the rest of it. So uh, when we... When we uh, let's say when we uh, transplant a an organ from one from one person to another, uh, you've probably heard the stories of someone had a heart transplant and then started loving to eat hamburgers, just like the person who loved hamburgers who gave his heart to this uh, person when he died. So, uh, <laughs> in other words, there's no separation, uh, no complete separation between the physical. Now, it, let's say the the uh, Anunnaki, just let's use that example. The Anunnaki decided that they would take some Homo erectus uh, uh, women and put some of their own genes into the Homo erectus women uh, and produce a hybrid. Well, with that uh, genetic material comes all of the other things that are in the soul genome. And uh, so you had a mixture. And this happens between cultures. I mean, look what happens when uh, different races uh, interbreed and and produce uh, 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 biracial uh, children. Uh, you know, it, it's you you get you get a multiple layered effect: physical, intellectual, spiritual. Uh, this is. And this is part of the process of a self-evolving, self-learning universe, is the mixture among individuals. I mean, this is why we have this uh, sexual reproduction system that we have. It actually strengthens us in the long run. And mm-hmm. uh, I think it happened, I, I think it. I think the Anunnaki intervention of humans uh, gave us a great... Uh, uplift in certain ways and I think we as humans have screwed it up by uh, making gods out of them and deifying them uh, and treating them as angels and the creator itself when they were only beings like us with a more advanced uh, culture and a more advanced technology. Now, what is the God gene? I mean, can you explain it to us? I mean, we all have junk DNA. What What is that exactly? Well, junk DNA, that's just a term. Uh, and by the way, let me say the God gene first. There's no such thing as a God gene. All genes are, are of God, and God is in all genes. So, you know, the, from my point of view, the universe is the manifestation of the creative force itself. So there's no separation uh, between that creative force and us as beings, individual beings in this universe. Uh, so I now forgot your question. I got sidetracked on the God gene. I, I was asking about junk DNA. What, oh, what is yeah, contained? Junk DNA. See, that's another one of these things that uh, the, uh, the terminology uh, was unfortunate. Uh, what junk DNA really was and I think people are getting away from using that term now because we know that it's very important. It has a very important function uh, of our in our whole in regulating our whole being. But what was called junk DNA was uh, the uh, DNA that we could not identify its purpose initially. Mm-hmm. In other words, we were able to uh, uh, to identify the the functions of a certain number of genes uh, and we could see that they were uh, involved in the production of protein in our cells and the mitochondrial DNA were engaged in the process of 
developing energy within the cell to do the synthesis work that's necessary for the reproduction of the cell itself and so on, and the repairing of the cells. Uh, But what we've come to understand is that this other 95% also has an impact on who we are and what we are and how we behave and so on. And it seems to be that a number of this, uh, or a portion of this, uh, somehow affects the on and off switches of the normal DNA functions. Uh, because you can take a gene, and if it expresses itself in one way, you get one result. If it expresses itself in another way, you get another result. And so we are now, many articles are out now in the scientific community saying, whoops, we made a mistake when we were going with the genome and saying every gene has its function and we can cure a disease if we know the right uh, gene. Uh, We can... Uh, determine what trait is going to be in that new baby because it has this particular gene. Well, it didn't work out that way. What we now know is that it is a much more complex process, and it involves this process of the epigenome, which maybe even has to do with learning, experience, knowledge, not things that are physical. So, Mm -hmm. uh, we... we, uh, we, we're, we're more complex than we could ever have imagined. Sure. Let me ask you, how does one start down the path of, of discovering who they were in a past life? Is, is Have you been able to figure out any some uh, form of formula as far as aiding people and in, in seeking that information? Well, uh, uh, I don't think there's any one particular formula. Uh, I think that... Uh, first step you take is to look at who you are now and uh, to the extent that you can look at who you were when you were very young you are according to the psychoplasm hypothesis that uh, we're working with in the reincarnation experiment uh, is that the psychoplasm uh, is a a container, if you please, uh, a carry forward, the transfer of past life legacies in uh, several areas. One of them is in the the genotype and the phenotype. This is the physical characteristics. Uh, The other four areas are what we call the psychological factors, and one of them has to do with your mind, with the way you think, the way your brain operates, uh, the the, uh, way you approach uh, new problems, uh, the environment, how you interact with ideas and other people, so that, you know, we are all different in that uh, way, but we uh, in psychology have been able to divide us up into different kinds of groups to say, you know, this is an intuitive person, this is a rational person, in the personality, uh, interpersonal area, we say, oh, this person is more of an extrovert than an introvert, and vice versa. And then we talk about uh, emotional people. You know, this person is very warm, and this person is cold as an ice cube. Uh, we, You know, we have all these terms. Uh, you can use just about any set of psychological measurements that you want to sort of get a profile of yourself. Uh, but on the website, reincarnationexperiment.org, we've got some uh, research forms there that people can look at, and, and you look at uh, yourself. Say, what what is the core essence of who I am? And then you have a sense that, well, to have this core essence today, I must have had some past lives that contributed to it. I had lives with experiences that contributed to it. So that if you were an outdoorsman and a sports person, uh, you know, you, you, you have had something along those lines. If you are a nerdy uh, uh, researcher in the lab or the library, you know, you, you, you have a sense of that past. If you are in the military and uh, want to be on the action front, wherever that is, 
that's going to tell you something too. So, so the first step is to know who you are, because who you are is a result of what you have been, who you have been. Now, that that poses some interesting questions, and and I'm going to inject one from the the chat room right okay. now. Okay. Um, and I want to expand on it a little bit. The, the basic question is, are societal embraced morals a reflection of spiritual growth of the group as a whole? Uh, so if, if you'll answer that one, and I'll throw in my curveballs. Uh, yeah, well, I think collectively uh, the, the morals and the culture of the society reflect the level of the soul development of the members of that society. Now, we know that some uh, people have more dominating influence and others have less dominating influence. But uh, when you put the whole thing together, you know, you are uh, creating your own reality. Uh, so the, the curveballs that I want to throw in there sure. are... Can a society? Well, I should I should ask first. Is do you believe that there are different soul groups on planet Earth right now? Whether that be of possibly alien origin, as far as uh, they weren't always human, or uh, just even an age itself? Are we literally dealing with actual soul groups? Like, could you look at let's say China and say that soul group X, and they are you know, 10 million years old compared to Russia that's 6 million years old. Or, or yeah, are you following that line yeah, of thinking? Yeah, I'm following that. And, I, you know, there's no way to prove uh, one conclusion or the other. But my, my work with a lot of different uh, groups involved in uh, past life research and looking at a lot of different cases, uh and not only mine, but also the cases of Ian Stevenson, who was a well-known psychiatrist for 47 years working at the University of Virginia. Uh, he's looked at that question uh, in some small way, as have other people. And this, uh, the uh, evidence seems to suggest that people have been in different cultures and in different uh, societies, different races, uh, um, either one sex or the other, different religions or ethnic groups, and that uh, there's not a... Uh, uh, we don't have distinctly separate groups in that sense. Uh, now, you may have a preponderance of, let's say, China, you know, got a billion-plus people. Uh, you probably have more people in that society who have had past lifetimes as Chinese or that Asian uh, people, in the same way you would have perhaps in Africa or in Europe. Uh, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, everybody who's in the Caucasian community in the United States at this point, uh, the evidence suggests that uh, many of them who are in the Caucasian community in the United States before have been uh, in the uh, uh, African uh, community in Africa or in the United States. There have been Orientals uh, uh, who are here, and people who are in Europe or Africa now may have had a past life in the United States. So uh, I don't think it's clear-cut. I do think that uh, there are uh, souls who have been evolving uh, over many more lifetimes than others. And I think that some souls have probably made more uh, progress in their learning and in their self-development than others. So we're not all the same. You know, the, the notion that all souls are equally pure and equally uh, perfect and uh, everything is, you know, at that level, uh, some ideal uh, uh, dimension. Uh, I would say that that's not the case, that we are all in varying levels of development and experience and so on. And we have had many, many different experiences in the past, 
and it would make sense uh, that we would go from one race to the other, to one area of the globe to the other, because that's how you can learn uh, by experiencing the differences. Uh, you learn much more when you do that than when you uh, stay in the same same area of, of experience. Now, I my my other question I was going to ask is is it, can it possibly be that a society is destructive to some people's souls? As far as uh, do people get born into a society that when you're talking about getting to know yourself uh, in order to you know find yourself who you have been, but the societal constructs teach you uh, flat out that reincarnation isn't real or everything that that you think is you they they basically wash that away and say no you're this yeah is oh this- absolutely and 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 this is one of the thing one of the areas that interests me most in my research in this soul genome area and there we have no way of proving it and and I'm just looking for anecdotal evidence at this point but the notion of the interplay between the uh, mundane life that we live in this incarnate form and its influence on the soul dimension and vice versa, because I think there's an interaction going on there too, Uh, which means that, yes, we can get into societies that get off track. I mean, there are a lot of people who think our society has gotten off track in the sense (laughs) Materialism, our our, our selfish war, uh, our warring mentality, uh, our uh, disregard for nature, our disregard for living healthily with one another. I mean, you know, there, you can make all these points, and I think they're valid. And uh, I think that that is affecting, you know, the other dimensional uh, aspects of all of us. I mean, we 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 are we don't just leave this uh, earth and go back to some pure uh, heaven somewhere, uh, we take back with us what we've done and learned on this planet. And if we've learned negative things, if we've learned uh, uh, retrogressive behaviors, then I think we're affecting the, you know, the whole being that we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, if it's a lear- if it's, I mean, you can see underlying my philosophy and my work and writing is that the, the universe is a natural universe. It is a universe of laws and principles, uh, and we are part of that. And uh, we, we can't uh, fool ourselves by creating these magical heavens and magical uh, ideas that are inconsistent, you know, with the way the universe works. I mean, we can't say... Uh, gee, the sun uh, decides one day that it will not shine again, or the sun decides one day that it will just uh, expand its uh, flares and uh, fry everyone on the earth. No, the sun goes according to the laws of nature, just like we and the earth uh, survive or not survive. And so we, we have to keep in mind that, at least from my perspective, that uh, uh, we should beware this notion of perfect ideal philosophy or perfect ideal religion or or the perfect scientific theory. I mean, hell, everything is in a process of change and evolution. And, and, And in fact, if it is that kind of a universe, then we are creating our tomorrow by the way we behave today. Now, you bring up some good points, and and we're in the modern age where it it does seem like uh, there's upheaval everywhere we turn, whether it's war or uh, you've got these countries across now northern Africa. Well, it was Europe, now northern Africa, rioting. Uh, government leaders fleeing. You've got uh, the United States warring all across the world in a, almost an empirical fashion and, and going broke at the same time. Right. 
Do you see the presence of advanced beings uh, or change towards – in other words, it seems like we're going from an old paradigm of, of very harsh control. I mean, you could look at the countries in North Africa or even Europe, and, and you, you had a very – uh, established uh, or aristocratic type uh, ruling there and then lower regular people and somewhat as of late the in the last 20 years we've kind of gotten that in the United States uh, do you see change on the horizon I mean are we going to see advanced beings coming to the forefront again I mean what are we seeing right now because this does play into our modern day and age well I, uh, the thesis that I articulate in the book God's Change in Consciousness is that uh, these uh, the level of intervention in human uh, history has vacillated over the ages and I think uh, the direct rule where you know uh, the AB sat on the top of the ziggurat and had a, a human woman taken to him as a sacrifice for the night uh, that ended uh uh, in an overt way, about uh, 3,500 or plus years ago. But I do think that there's still ongoing uh, intervention and involvement. I think it's going, it's happening on a positive level, if you want to use that term, or let's say constructive level, and it's also happening on a dis- on a destructive level. Uh, and you know. None of us can put all the pieces together right now. I mean, I, you know, I follow the the UT, uh, the UFO, the ET uh, research literature. I follow the spiritual uh, higher beings, ascended masters, all of that uh, activity, and I try to. I'm not an expert in any of those areas, but I try to keep enough awareness of what's going on there to know that there seems to be at least the human perception that we're getting some good advice and, and good suggestions from some groups and we're getting, uh, you know, destructive and even intervention and and control of us uh, on some other groups. Uh, so I don't know how to, how to answer your question there. I, I think that uh, we are going through a period of upheaval and turmoil because this is part of the cycle. You know, once you build up certain cultures, certain institutions, and what happens inevitably, apparently, is that they get so stuck on themselves that they get out of touch with the rest of the the planet. And so what happens is this rising up from the bottom to tear down these structures, like my book, Dismantling the Pyramid. Uh, And uh, uh, then you get a new cycle. So I think that we probably look at these things like uh, uh, the charges of uh, advanced beings, you know, coming and saving us from ourselves, or on the other hand, coming to take us over, on the other hand, I think those are rather simplistic, idealistic concepts, and we need to keep in mind that it's an ongoing, uh, I think the theme that would go through my book there would be, uh, we've never been alone, the degree of interaction has vacillated over Mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what comes to mind is a phrase I, I actually I don't know it popped in my mind and I, I wanted to do something with it but I haven't done anything with it but it, it basically goes it's all a school until graduation day when we graduate is the day we leave this earth you know meaning the physical end of our lives uh, do you believe that soul groups uh, will leave this earth uh, I mean do we are we constantly eternally incarnated here, reincarnated here, or do we graduate and go elsewhere permanently? Well, uh, my my belief is, and this is solely a belief, uh, I believe that we uh, as individuals uh, evolve individually and that I suspect that at some point 
individual souls uh, may evolve into uh, remaining in one of those other divisions uh, or other dimensions, uh, you know, after so, so much time on, on this planetary incarnation. Now, I'm also, I wouldn't uh, state that it would be impossible that, that some of us uh, may very well uh, have... Uh, interplanetary incarnations and so on I think that wh why not I mean if life is is somewhat uh, uh, connected and similar throughout the universe uh, where you are physically uh, could uh, change from time to time but I don't think of a, I don't think we ought to think about the notion of I'm living this lifetime I'm learning my lessons and I'm going to graduate and go on forever for some other time. I think uh, most of us are probably still in the in the process of coming and going. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's better to think that way because it means that we'll be more responsible and more sensitive and more careful about the way we live this lifetime uh, if we think we're coming back and going to have to live in the mess that we've created. <laughs> the Garden of Eden that we've created, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, so we've got a little bit of time. Uh, do any of the people that speak on reincarnation, do, do they ever mention, do they ever recall what happened uh, between lives? And if so, were their experiences similar? Well, you know, a uh, guy, Michael Newton, uh, has written a book about... Uh, a lot of cases that he's worked with, uh, and that suggests you know there's this commonality and 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 so on. the The problem with that kind of material is uh, it's very subjective, and we have no way of, of validating it. And in fact, mm. ca you can't even use the notion that well, a thousand people said something similar uh, when they've been uh, processed by the same person or the same process. <laughs> You know, which mm -hmm. may very well uh, determine the outcome. I mean, we know that from social sciences uh, uh, that uh, you can have contamination and uh, auto suggestion and, and external suggestion for, for creating this material. Uh, but I, I, I do think that uh, if one looks at a lot of different uh, areas, including channel material from so-called Ascended Masters and others, uh, I do think that there is uh, a, a period of consciousness, and it would certainly make sense that if we are uh, quite conscious in this incarnation, and that if we lose our physical uh, blinders, uh, we would probably be even more conscious and so, therefore, there should be a reflection and and uh, sort of self-evaluation and talking to other beings about the experiences they've had and sharing uh, what everyone has learned. You know, this is a way to make progress. It's like we get out of school at in the end of May and we meet up with our friends from elsewhere in the summer and we learn from each other and, and share ideas and so forth. And then we go back to school in September and start over again. So... Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me, but I don't think we have, you know, any empirical evidence to to support. Mm -hmm. Now, we're we're coming close to the hour, so I I've got a, one last quick question. Hopefully, it's not too monstrous of one. Uh, it's posed from one of our uh, listeners in the the chat room right now. Uh, Reincarnation. Incarnation seems to impose a finite number of souls, yet our population seems to be ever expanding. Are there new souls being created? Well, I think the answer to that is that uh, for us to say anything is finite is rather uh, uh, arrogant. Uh, we have no idea what the potential and uh, possibilities are in the universe at large. And the fact that uh, we have so many people, I've done the, the math on, on this a uh, couple of times with uh, people who are uh, population experts, uh, uh, we could handle the six billion that we've got based on 
uh, souls that have come into life for one lifetime or, or others uh, because of such short lifetimes in the early days of our species. But uh, I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, I think if we are a uh, self-evolving universe and that we are a uh, uh, conscious base universe, uh, then the creation of new not only souls in our species, but the creation of new species as they evolve uh, from one place to the other uh, in the universe. Uh, I don't think that's even even an issue. Uh, uh, we don't know how these things uh, uh, split up. We don't know. We, I mean, it's like, you know, two, two parents can have many kids. Uh, you can have identical twins. Uh, we don't understand how these physical uh, principles work uh, at that level of the soul genome. Uh, but I think that there's not any problem of uh, having a continual supply of, of conscious entities uh, incarnating in physical form. In fact, maybe that uh, one possibility that I've thought about is that uh, the soul doesn't start until it has one life form, <laughs> and then from hmm. that life form goes the soul continuing on a path of reincarnation. Mm. Interesting. Yep. All right, sir, we're down to four minutes on the show. Uh, we'd like to ask all our guests if they have any charities they'd like to plug. Uh, do you have yours? Well, Given my sort of international orientation and, and work in so many different countries, I tend to look uh, towards international charities. And one that I've been uh, supporting this last year is International Rescue Committee at IRC. One can go on the web and check them out. They are very, very active in any kind of uh, disaster tragedy. Uh, they were very active in Pakistan and Haiti and other places this year that, and this past year that uh, suffered from uh, cataclysmic uh, uh, physical events like uh, flooding and um, earthquakes and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Another one that I really like to mention is the uh, Doctors Without Borders or the Médecins Sans Frontières it started in, in Europe, and uh, that was the name, and now it's in English, uh, Doctors Without Borders. They work uh, in places that are dangerous. They work uh, where people have really suffered from war, uh, uh, revolution, uh, natural disasters, and uh, helping uh, people uh, in the most urgent need. And I, I support them uh, on a regular basis. And would recommend other people to have a look at them. We have Paul Von Ward on the line, and we are going to go to him now. Welcome and good evening to the show, Paul. You're on the air. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. You're, it's a pleasure to have you here. So we're here to discuss your work on uh, the soul genome and uh, your work is a, is a work in spirituality overall. Uh, but you didn't begin that way. How, how you actually started out as a Protestant minister? Can can you give us a little bit of background information uh, as far as your your progression possibly into a more spiritual belief system in actually natural spirituality? Sure. Uh, like uh, everyone else, I grew up in a an established uh, culture uh, uh, that had a lot of uh, influence on my early development. I think most of us come into life and get engaged initially that way. And some of us stay in the same sort of cultural fr uh, framework or mindset uh, the rest of their lives. But uh, most of us actually evolve over time. And I grew up in the rural uh, backwoods of northwest Florida back in the 40s and the 50s. And uh, the only uh, sort of intellectual uh, 
stimuli, I guess one would say, that was available at that time uh, was that of local fundamentalist religious groups of one sort or the other. So I developed in that in that fashion. But I uh, remember very vividly uh, when I actually joined the church uh, and uh, was saved as the that they ask for that. A ref- that they deserve. Uh, the, yes, that it's a reflection of society. Can, that's, that's correct. Now, it just seems like it molds into everything else you're working on. Well, you know, I didn't think about it in those terms uh, for about 10 or 15 years because I wrote that book, Dismantling the Pyramid, Government by the People, actually about 30 years ago. And it was a point in my life when I had been in the Foreign Service in the State Department in Washington for about 15 years, and I had been chosen uh, by some senior officials along with a number of other young middle uh, not middle age, but middle grade officials in the government. We weren't at the top, but we had a good bit of experience. And I was actually uh, given the opportunity to go to Harvard to develop a master's degree in uh, public administration, studying organizational psychology and government reform and all those things, because a number of people at that time, and this was uh, taking place uh, in the last years of the Nixon administration, And when the Carter administration began, uh, we thought we had a lot of opportunity to make some changes uh, to reform the self-perpetuating sort of uh, insulated bureaucracy and special interest and uh, corporate uh, lobbyists and so on that we know so much about today. It, It existed at that time, and so I wrote this book to talk about how this uh situation that we worked ourselves into with a government that is not uh, able to really reflect the uh, needs and priorities of of the citizens that have uh, supported it. Uh, And I I thought that was sort of a political uh, book, and as I went on and worked, the terminology was used in those days, uh, at age 12, but the next day... Paul, Paul. Yeah. Can I? Can I? Uh, I'm getting. I'm actually reading this in the shtf 411com chat room. Uh, can you speak up a little bit? I, I think they're having a hard time hearing. Okay, well, let's be see. You want to t- test the uh, the volume? Is it going now? Uh, yeah, I think so. you're. That's much better. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just try to hold the uh, receiver a little bit more directly in front of my mouth. And let okay. and to make that story short. <laughs> I, I grew out very quickly as I went off to college and started uh, uh, particularly reading in uh, comparative religions and philosophy and, and finding out that uh, the world was very different than the uh, very narrow-minded uh, community that I had grown up in. So by the time I was uh, in uh, my junior year or senior year in college, I had developed uh, very much, though, in the, in the church and had been ordained as a minister. And, in fact, as, as I started graduate school, uh, I had a small church outside of Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, but during gra- the first year of grad- graduate school, I had some experiences with uh, people who really uh, changed my perspective. One of them was the renowned uh, Protestant theologian, uh, Paul Tillich, who came to our university and uh, talked to him about definitions of God. And when this great theologian sat there in front of our little group and said, well, it depends on your definition. <laughs> and I began to uh, say, okay, well, let me think about what my definition is. And for a long time, ever so often, I would write down my definition of God. And years later, when I looked at it, I really made some radical shifts as I uh, studied other religions and met other people. And so I left graduate school and went into the Navy and then in the Foreign Service and traveling around the world for 15 or more years to many, many countries, uh, reading uh, many uh, historical texts and religious texts and and looking into the cultural belief systems of many different societies on the planet. And I I came to some sort of uh, what I call eclectic, uh, natural uh, spirituality as uh, a way that I found satisfactory uh, to uh, merge uh, 
what I had learned as uh, a student of science in, in college and university, and uh, looking at the belief systems that people had about humans being something more than physical beings, biological beings. There was something deeper and more multidimensional about that. And so I've, I've, uh, over the years after I uh, had a lot of activities and this cross-cultural career that I've had, uh, I've been writing now for the last 15-plus uh, years uh, books like those that you mentioned. Uh, one earlier one was Our Solarian Legacy, which was on multidimensional humans in a self-learning universe. That's sort of a cosmology that uh, merges the notion of uh, other dimensions that are not in our 4D reality that most of us experience on a daily basis. Now, you actually, one of your, your very first book, I, I have to ask, this is actually, an, I, I, it's almost another show, but I want to ask because I read something. It, it's Dismantling the Pyramid, Government by the People. Now, when I read excerpts from that and, and your thoughts on it, you basically said that a, a people get the government that they, they embody. In other areas, particularly in international cultural and educational training and so on, I, I left it behind, but then more recently I have come to realize that uh, what you say is true. The, the institutions that we create and that we support as a people really reflect uh, the limitations of our own uh, uh, development as citizens and as communities uh, in, 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 the, in the nation. And so I've been talking a lot recently about the notion of self-governance. Now, as I mentioned, you know, that book, Our Solarian Legacy, which was my first interdisciplinary cosmology that I've, I've worked on, uh, what came out of that in, in the research that I did in physics and biology and history and uh, the social sciences and so on is that, you know, we are actually a self-learning universe, and all species are self-learning. That is, we experiment, we have, ex have uh, the results of our behaviors uh, manifest in our lives, and we learn something from that experience. We either learn a lot or we don't learn very much, but nevertheless, we're self-learning people. So if we are self-learning spiritual beings, uh, then governance should be thought of as self-governance. And so that's the theme that I've been developing more recently in articles and, and talks that I do, that we as individuals have the responsibility to uh, develop a system of governance that is a reflection of ourselves. And it's that challenge that we're facing right now that we're 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 split. Uh, government has become encapsulated.